Happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you very much, Rhonda. It was lovely music. Thank you, Pastor, for having me and lending me your pulpit today. I've been in the country for the past five months, and in the past five months, this is the second time I'm standing up to speak for the Lord. What I'm trying to say is I'm a little, I think I'm getting a little rusty here. Today I'd like to share with you from, like Pastor mentioned, from the book of, or the Gospel of Matthew, and we're looking at uh, the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter five, verses uh, three down to verse 12. Just to give you an overview of the Gospel of Matthew. When you look at the uh, Gospel of Matthew, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapters five down to chapter seven contains what we call the Sermon on the Mount, which describes how members of the kingdom of heaven should live. Members of the kingdom of heaven, talking about you and me how we should live. And then we find Jesus' statement in verses three down to 12, which are known as the Beatitudes. Now, when we look at the Gospel of Matthew, you see that there are five primary speeches by Jesus. And these five speeches sets the tone for the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. And today, we will be spending time, or we will be resting our thoughts on the Beatitudes, or the Mount of the Beatitudes. Let's bow our heads for a short word of prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this day of rest. Lord, we now meditate upon your word, and as we do this, we pray that you would speak to us. Amen. I love my family. Oh, she's here. I love my wife a lot. Now, it's a totally different story that I irritate her as much as I love her. In a good way, that is. But you know what? I was not always certain that she loved me back. This was because I used to receive all these text messages, Facebook messages, emails, phone calls that would actually end with, I hate you. Really? I hate you. Or, I hate you a lot. I'm being serious here, actually. And for a time, I was a little confused. And in my thoughts, I would think, in my heart, in my mind, I would think, does my wife really love me? Or is she thinking on leaving me? It was much, much later in our marriage, now we have been married for five years, six months or so, so it was much later that I finally understood what she meant. She was actually, what she was doing was she was actually playing a game with me. Not playing with me, but playing a game with me and, and so, whenever she would say, I hate you, she would be basically saying, I love you. So, when she, say, uh, when she was saying, I hate you a lot, she used to mean, uh, what she meant was, I love you a whole lot. The game that she was playing with me was the game of opposites. I'm not really sure how many of you have ever played that game, or how many of you do that. It was not something that, uh, you know, really amused me. <laughs> but here we are today, six years later. I love her, and I love her a lot. Opposites. Now when we look at the Gospel of Matthew, and when we look at Matthew chapter five, verse three to 12, it's pretty much the same. 
opposites. It describes a kingdom of which you and I are a member of as a kingdom which seems to be upside down. And that is where our topic is taken from, an upside down kingdom of heaven. Today we'll be dwelling on, on this passage of scripture. This passage of uh, Matthew chapter five, verses three to 12 really fascinates me. I'm fascinated by all, basically everything there is in the Bible, but this is one passage that I love to study and read about. And in particular, there's this one word. And that word is blessed. Each of the Beatitudes basically say, blessed are you, right? Blessed are you, blessed are you. So this one word really actually fascinates me and, I, and I'd like us to actually spend a few moments in trying to understand what this word means. When we look at the Greek from which this word has been translated from, no, the slide is actually seems to be messed up. But the Greek word is makareos. Makareos can be translated or be understood in three ways. Number one, blessed. Number two, happy. And number three, fortunate. So in essence, what, what Makareos basically means is, or what it describes is, a sphere of someone being blessed, or a sphere of someone who is favored. And in this case, favored by God. Makareos. Now I'd like to apply this understanding to the Beatitudes, or I would like to read to you how I translate the Beatitudes today. So let me try this for us. We are looking at the first text. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, or in other words, happy are the poor in spirit. Okay, so what I've done is I've removed the, the word blessed and I've put in happy. Because it means the same thing. Both of them have been taken from the word makareos, which is the root. So, makareos are the poor in spirit. Makareos, or happy are the poor one does this make sense to you? Happy are the poor. It doesn't, right? How can you be poor and be happy? Or how can you be happy? You know, I think the idea is, or how we understand this is, we can be happy when our pockets are, what? Loaded. Happy are the rich. Happy are those who have luxury cars, luxury homes. Happy are those with a six-figure bank balance. But what is being said here? Happy are those who are poor. Happy are the poor. Let me ask you, ask you this question. How many of you have witnessed poverty? Now I understand we as a church, past time saying we, I'm part of you now, <laughs> even though my membership is not here yet, it will get here, but I understand that we as a church are running uh, a program every Sunday, Feed the Homeless, right? We have witnessed what poverty is, but how many of us here today this Sabbath, have actually experienced it? How many of us have experienced poverty? What does it mean to be poor? What does it entail? We cannot pay bills, right? 
But when we look at this verse, it says, blessed are the poor. It's not talking about being poor in terms of money. It does not talk about being poor in terms of finances. It is talking about being poor in the spirit. Being poor in spirit. So if you ever, if you have ever experienced poverty, if you have ever been poor, you'd probably understand the feeling that is behind it, the emotions behind it. When you're poor, if you have ever, if you were ever poor, remember that feeling that you went through. You could not do things on your own. You needed someone to assist you. Probably it was your family, or probably you needed someone else to help your friend, or perhaps the government to step in and assist you to get you on, onto your feet. It is that time in your life that you are actually dependent on someone else, something else. It is a time when you are in need and you cannot help yourself. But over here, in this text, in verse three, we find it's saying, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know what this text is really saying? Happy are the poor in spirit is to, is to recognize that you need something. It is to recognize that you need God in your life. It is to recognize that you and I cannot manufacture our own happiness. It is to recognize that you and I cannot do it on our own. This verse is saying, happy are those who depend on God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me ask you another question. Where do you find your happiness? Do you find your happiness in food? Do you find your happiness in uh, let's see, do you find your happiness in your family, in sports, in that special someone? Where do you find your happiness? It is a valid question. We say, if I have this one thing, I would be happy. It would make me happy. But then we do not realize, or we, we think that it makes us happy, but in reality it doesn't make us happy. The only way, or the only source of true happiness is God. The, and that is the only way. So blessed are those, happy are those who know that. Happy are those that understand that happiness is being dependent on who? On God. Happiness or true happiness is based on God. We cannot find true happiness anywhere else but in God and on God. Jesus continues and he says in the next verse, blessed are those that mourn, or happy are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Does it make sense? Happy are those who cry, happy are those who, what? Grieve. Happy are those that mourn. How many of you are happy when you cry? I know I don't. I hate crying. Once again, this actually does not make sense. How can I be happy when I'm mourning, when I'm crying, when I'm sad, when I'm grieving? But Jesus says, blessed, no, happy are those who mourn. It is actually the opposite, right? That's the way we understand it. Happy are we when we smile, when we rejoice, 
That's how we understand it. But Jesus is talking about something that is opposite to what we see as real. Who wants to mourn? Who wants to be in sadness? Who wants to be in grief? We all have lost something in our lives or someone in our life. Someone we have, someone we have loved. You know, I realized the pain behind this when my wife Nina and I, we lost our baby two years ago. I realized that pain is actually a good thing. I realized how much we as a couple, how much Alicia was looking forward for this new addition in our family. And when we look at this text, that's where this, this, this feeling is coming from. And there's this reality that goes on with having this, this emotion of mourning, this experience of mourning, and this is something that is actually real to us. You know, a lot of people, what they try to do is they try to avoid these things. What they do is they try a whole lot of things or they try different ways to actually mask their emotions or whatever it is. But Jesus here says, blessed are those that are grieving, that are in mourning. Once again, this verse is talking about dependency. It is talking about dependency on God because you know that you are not alone. Amen. That you are not alone, that God is with you and that God is comforting you. Amen. Think about that. It is in our sadness, it is in our loneliness or whatever that is going on in our lives. We have this assurance, we have this, this comfort that God is right there beside us. He's not just standing there but he's intimately connected to us and he's comforting us. Amen. By our side, helping us. You know what I think? I think that is sufficient, that is enough to know that we are happy, that we can be blessed, that we can be happy because our God is comforting us, that he is here with us. Jesus does not stop there, he continues. Then he says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This does not make sense either. Now, we see the Goliaths of our time. We see, the, we, see, we see soldiers of these great armies. We see, we, we have seen news, we have seen pictures of, of, of these countries with this incredible firepower. And we, we see that, that those that have the greatest amount of things, that, that those that have the greatest amount of power will win this world, will be able to control the world. And we see that governments all over this world are actually in a race to become the strongest. But Jesus here says that the meek will inherit the earth. Jesus says, blessed are those that are meek who will inherit the earth. Those who are humble will inherit the earth. What is humility anyway? Humility is realizing that our God is more powerful 
It is realizing that our God is more powerful than me, than you, than all of us put together. It means putting our trust in his strength and not our own. And I assure you this, all the military artillery of this world, everything that humanity can provide is nothing compared to the strength of God. We may be meek and humble ourselves, but we are servants of a God who is capable of all of this and more who is stronger than everything and anything that we can throw at him. Jesus does not stop there. He continues and he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This verse or this beatitude is not talking about food or or water, it is talking about our passions. Let me ask you this, what are you passionate about? Oh, who are you passionate about? Now some of you may be passionate about art, some of you may be passionate, oh, someone, some of you may love your cars, some of you may be passionate about your family, about your children. The other day I found out that there are some of us here who are passionate about exercise. Think about it. What are you passionate about? You know, we can be passionate about a whole lot of things in our lives. But this verse is saying, blessed are those, oh, happy are those who hunger who thirst, not for food, but for righteousness. I would like to say, happy are those who are passionate for Jesus, who are passionate for God. Now I understand, I understand full well that those other things, our children, our families, our employment, all of these things are important. They're really good, but you know what happens sometimes? Sometimes all of these things, they take first place in our life. They go ahead of God in our lives. And our thirst and hunger for God becomes a once a week thing, a Sabbath thing, 11 o'clock thing, You know what? Let's make a change. Let's turn it around. Let us be passionate about God, about Jesus. It's okay to be passionate for our children and all of these other things in our lives. It's important to do that, but let us be thirsty. Let us hunger for God in our lives. And happy are those who do that. Now what does the word blessed mean again? Happy. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for Jesus. Jesus continues and he says, blessed are the merciful, thank you. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown Mercy. Now we were talking about this, a a little of this in our Sabbath school, I remember. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are you when someone hurts you and you are able to forgive. Blessed are those that don't hold grudges. Blessed are those who open their hearts to their enemies. Blessed are those who don't, who don't judge other cultures and other communities that are different from yours. Blessed are those that are compassionate. 
Now, what does blessed mean? It means happy. If you want to be happy, just in a summary form, if you want to be happy, be able to forgive. If you want to be happy, don't hold grudges. Jesus continues and says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are those that are innocent. Now when we talk about innocent, we talk about children. In our mind, we think of children. We think about our kids. There's no one as pure as children. So we, we think that, oh, this verse is saying that those who seek purity will be happy. We see this, this text as only applying to children, but it is not so. We can apply this text to ourselves as well. Yes, we have made mistakes, but that doesn't mean that we cannot be pure anymore. All we have to do is to pray and to ask God to say, Lord, yes, I have made my share of mistakes, but now, Lord, I want to make a change. I want to seek to be pure. Help me. And we will be happy. We will be happy when we seek to be pure. Jesus continues and he says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. Peacemakers. You know, did you know that it takes two people to create a conflict? It takes two people to create or to make war. We also talked about this in our Sabbath school today. You know, I was an only, only child. And I, I used to do all, all sorts of things to try to keep myself entertained, to keep myself amused. You know, one of the things that I used to do was, when I was a little grown up, I used to play cards. Not with someone else, but with myself. Okay? I used to do eight, jack, I win. I used to play myself, I used to try my best to keep myself amused, entertained. And it was not fun. Now, war is not fun either. But it can be particularly boring if you are alone. So someone or anyone can choose not to create or not to engage in war. They can choose to create peace in the midst of conflict. You and I can say, can say no. And this text is saying, happy are those that love peace. Happy are those who are peacemakers. I want to be a peacemaker. Jesus continues and he says, blessed are those that are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I think it is most important for us to actually determine what persecution is in this case. Sometimes we can think that, hey, all of these bad things is happening in my life. I'm blessed. But we do not realize why these things are happening in my life. Sometimes what happens is we make the wrong choices and things happen to us. This text or this beatitude is not talking about those types of things. It's not talking about persecution that results from our own actions, from our own choices. It is talking about persecution because of righteousness, because of God's sake. This persecution that this beatitude is looking at or implying is a result of our choice to stand firm for God. 
That is what it is talking about. Blessed are those that are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because we have chosen to stand firm, to stand pure before God. Remember, the Beatitudes, they imply an upside down kingdom of God. Something that is opposite to the reality that you and I know. Happy are not the rich, happy are the uh, the poor. Blessed are not those who laugh and rejoice. Blessed are those who mourn. The wo- you know what Jesus is saying? The world will go this way, but Jesus is saying that, he's telling us to go this way. And when that happens, there's something that we, we call friction. When that happens, friction arises. Persecution arises. And Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you face friction for my sake. Why? Because you and I are not following the world, but we are following God. Happy are those that have wisdom to know this. Happy are those who have the wisdom to know why this persecution is happening to us. Because we are standing for God. Happy are those who know why this persecution is happening and being okay with it. I'm not really sure how many of you are okay when you are being persecuted for Christ's sake. Happy are those that are persecuted because of righteousness. Jesus continues and he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is the reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's an upside down kingdom that we are looking towards, that God is calling us towards. So when we are following Jesus, we are doing what we know is opposite. We know is upside down. But let me tell you this, Jesus and the way that he proposes to us today is the only way for us, for you and me, to find true happiness. And it is the one thing that can bring us the most amount of happiness and joy. So dear church, if happiness has been distant in your life, This may be the start of it. This can be a start of it. Let us strive to live up to what Jesus has asked us to be. Let us pray. Father, thank you for sharing with us the reality of heaven or what heaven can be for us. Lord, as we depart from your house of prayer, we pray that you'd accompany us. Help us to be happy. Help us to spread your happiness to others. In your name we pray, amen.